farm workers are excluded from that federal law. So that left them extremely vulnerable. They would either have to rely upon state laws that would mirror the federal law or have no laws at all. And sadly, I know in California in the 1970s, they passed a state law version of it that helped the workers there, but New York did not pass the law until 2019. So really, for, for all of this time, these workers did, did not have any of those protections that most of the other workers in this country have and enjoy. <coughs> With so many workers coming into the county each year, New York State had to step up their efforts and create regulations. Um, they had to, um, 1946, the migrant registration law, each uh, crew leader or person who wanted to employ uh, workers on their farms and areas, they had to register with the Department of Labor, also the South County Health Department as well. And then those laws were bolstered in 1954, 1958. Uh, governors uh, Dewey and Harvey signed laws wide sweeping laws that covered the conditions of the labor camp. They were meant to keep it to keep them in proper running water. Um, sadly the, you know these laws, as tough as they may have seen on paper, were not necessarily translated into what the camp became. Uh, and also local zoning was required. I know we've seen the records here in South Hole that in nineteen forty three they, they would be brought from the public. You know, we want to put a labor camp here, what what do you all make? Well obviously initially the public was was opposed to it. There was racial animus, and also just concerned about people from outside, not knowing who they are, who they are, where they're from, coming to the community to work on the area. So there was natural skepticism and and, and, um, and refusal, but that eventually waned. This after all was and is largely a farming community. So somebody had to pick the crops and something had to get done, so eventually that resistance waned. Now, the number of camps vary. In 1943, there were four camps, and I'll get into those shortly. And you see the slight increase in 1951, but notice the sharp spike. 1958, there were 134 labor camps registered in Suffolk County alone. Staggering amount for, again, not necessarily a large geographical area. By 1960, you see the slight dip to 120 camps, and then each decade, it starts to downward decline, which reasons I'll get into shortly. You heard the term, we hear it all the time, what is a labor camp? It, it's interchangeable. Uh, it could be the barracks that we've traditionally seen, but in essence, it's any structure that was used to house migrant workers. Different size, different shapes, different forms of buildings, some far worse, some, some, some uh, better. But, you know, they included shacks, run-down buildings, private homes, old barns, trailers. Um, and the one case that I'll get into this also is an old historic mansion in Greenport was used as a labor camp. The conditions of the camps always were probably best described from poor to worse. They continued to, to deteriorate over the years. They always had this secretive, prison-like atmosphere. Uh, they were isolated, kind of off the, off the beaten path, if you will. Uh, unsanitary, poorly maintained, hazardous. And they were dangerous. There was no security, no one, no one to kind of police the areas. Uh, no privacy. Most of the workers, there would be a large room, maybe half this size, and would just be bunk beds. And they would all sleep in these rooms. Uh, and really not much more space than the width of your bed is what they would be assigned. Um, so they called that the bullpen style sleeping quarters. And again, because there was out of sight, out of mind, it actually, there was little public sympathy for, you know, uh, understanding the nature of the camps and wanting to better their condition. The first, uh, migrant, the first recorded migrant labor camp uh, was located just less than a mile from here in the economy. It's a three-story Lake Cottage home in the surrounding area. It opened in 1943. The U.S. government contracted with the uh, island of Jamaica, that island nation, to bring approximately 100 farm workers to work under contract with the government to work here in the, in the Um The conditions at this camp were fair. The U.S. government paid for the transportation. These workers were flown in to Louisiana, taking a long train ride up to here, Connick. Uh, and they would work for, this, for the harvest season generally from August to November. And within weeks, three other, other camps opened at the same time as with the U.S. government. One in Kings Park, one in Greensport, and one in Fort Jefferson. All four approximately 400 farm workers. Now this again was a short-lived program. You see it ended by 1947 after the U.S. ended those contracts. But the conditions at, these, at this camp, these four camps, were bad. They were in fact good because they had the strong oversight of the government and they were paying for it. Let's face it, cost counts. So local farmers who, who did not struggle with those added costs, this was an important factor that led to these camps being in better condition. Camp, the Lake Lodge later camp was located. It's 
not far from here, beautiful uh, home. Um, you know, this home has a, has a story history. It's, um, it's, you know, again, being that it was one of the one of the first labor camps is part of that history now. Um, I was really pleased to have found um, information on this camp, photographs, uh, and learn more about it. They're right behind it's a beautiful little lake, and beyond that's the Long Island Sound. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, pristine area, and again, it was used as a labor camp for approximately four or five years. There's some of the workers at that labor camp. Again, they came from the island of Jamaica. These, these gentlemen were allowed for their tireless work ethic. They worked in their home islands and sugar and banana plantations, and they seemingly were iron men. They could work 10 hours a day, they did high production, um, and, and they were treated again fairly well. And the conditions here were ideal um, to continue. By far and large, the largest and eventually most notorious labor camp was known as the Cutchog Labor Camp located on Cox Lane, uh, to Middle Road, County Road 48, and Oregon Road. It was first created in 1944. The group of local farmers called formed the Eastern Suffolk Cooperative, like a company, if you will, of local growers from South Hold and Shelter Island. And they purchased the land to construct the camp. Army barracks were, were, were constructed, cabin-style units with military platform tents, these green tents that were over the rooftops, to seemingly to keep out the foul weather, the wet weather. Um, this was the largest known camp in New York State, certainly, probably throughout the entire era. There was up to 300 workers at any given time could stay at this camp. It had the only known school for migrant children, Helen Prince. A notable Helen Prince was a, an educator at this camp for many years. Uh, there was also a daycare center for children and migrant workers. There was also a small restaurant, which is very rare. It had a small eatery. I, I would say eatery, described as a restaurant, it's called the Dixie Bell Inn. It was a tavern and it's also a small store where Goods and serpent goods were always provided <coughs> via the high markups to the workers at the camp. Here's a photograph of the um, Cutchell Labor Camp. The, the road in the middle is called the Main Street. You see the camp, the cabins on the right, with the tents over them. All the way in the back on the far right was the men's barracks, the large barracks where they would sleep in these, these bunker style sleeping areas, just bunk beds stacked in. This, you were coming on this road, go all the way through and out. If anyone's familiar with the property, you may see it. It's still there, of course, not the camp. It's a commercialized property now, but uh, kind of the remnants of, of the footprint, if you will, the same. Here's a promotional advertisement in 1953 by the Eastern Suffolk Cooperative touting the amenities of the camp, which, by and large, everything on this piece of paper was accurate. They had a credit teacher, Ellen Prince. They had recreation, the Long Island Sound nearby, and swimming and fishing and all the things they, they would claim to have. Um, so yeah, you can see how they were soliciting um, help. And, and again, this goes to the struggles that the farmers had. They, they needed help. There wasn't enough help locally, and the government wasn't open anymore, so they really had to do what they could to uh, bring in as much help as possible. Here's a photograph of Helen Prince in the, the classroom. It was a room made to be a classroom. Helen was a staunch educator and a wonderful person uh, to take upon this effort. So, uh, you know, it's not ideal of a school setting. Right outside this room, there was a leaky pipe with some raw sewage, with terrible smells, odors. Um, and Helen was always advocating for more funds for the, for the school, to build on it, to make it better, to teach the kids. And sadly, the camp operators weren't so receptive. At one point, they told her, but Helen, you don't have to teach anything, you just have to keep order. You know, it was that kind of difference that a lot of the camp operators had that really, you know, didn't make this as optimal of an education setting that it should be. Here's a photograph inside one of the cabins. You see on the left of what appears to be that here, of the, the lead. But notice that the, the dirty bedding, the, the debris strewn on the floor, the bare walls. Um, in the next one as well. And you'll see in this, you see the bumps on each side. So at most, at least four people would have stayed inside this cabin. It, it, no real amenities. Um, it was just what it was. It was a, a roof over the head mentality where workers would stay and be kept uh, on that. Next. Well, should I go back to the one thing about the Cutshaw Labor Camp, um, that's right. So one thing I'll about the Cutshaw Labor Camp, over the years, again, it was a large camp. It was a, a fully operational camp. So what I mean by that is local growers and farmers would drive up to the camp, they would speak with the crew leaders and camp operators, and say, we need, I need six workers on my farm. They'd jump in the back of a pickup truck, be driven to the farm, maybe two, two miles away, work on the farm for the day, they would bring them back to the camp, and that's where the workers would stay. 
We're sort of like a depot, if you will, of labor, where workers were readily available to work on these farms. Over the years, conditions deteriorated rapidly. It was pre featured in Harvest of Shame, the Edward R. Murrow's 1960 documentary, which was aired on Thanksgiving Day, for the purpose of shaming the nature of how our farm workers are treated in this country. Um, and it was a, a very illuminating uh, documentary called Harvest of Shame. And over the years, this, this um, you know, workers were driven by poverty and, and, and really just terrible conditions. And in this case, in 1961, four farmers, um, four farm workers lost their lives. They were Leroy McCoy and Charles Jordan. They were found dead in their sleeping quarters. A fire, a fire erupted. What happened was they brought in a kerosene stove to cook meals. The, the cost of the meals at the camp was 75 cents a meal. They couldn't afford it. So they cut corners. They brought in the stove. They were a band. They weren't allowed to have it. They brought it in anyway to try to save some money. And sadly, a uh, fire broke out when the stove tilted over. Uh, two of them died, were found dead right at the scene. One man, James Davis, was found after he got out of the fire, ran back in and retrieved a new pair of shoes that he just bought. Sadly, he was overcome by the smoke and he passed away. And James Overstreet, another man, was actually pulled out from the fire through the structure, brought to a nearby hospital, but he died from his wounds not so long ago. This was in October of 1961. Um, you know, and again, it was just a sad indictment of men in extreme poverty. Who, who tried to cut corners and cost them their lives. It's really a miracle of war. People didn't die that day. And the, the, cost, of, the cost of the damage here was between fifteen and 25000 which doesn't seem like a lot today, but back then it was a lot of money. Heavy, expensive damage. Over the years, this camp continued to deteriorate. 1970, they lost their permit. They got it back. It went back and forth. Until 1983, the land was sold, and the Eastern Suffolk property of dissolved almost 40 years to the day it was first formed. Um, and it's just a, 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 a you know a long, a long legacy of this camp uh, as one of the symbols of this era. At the same time, the Eastern Suffolk Cooperative operated what was known as the Greenport Labor Camp. It was the site that Richard Conklin mentioned. It was built in 1962 on the North Road, just east of Chapel Lane in Greenport. For those who may want to know where, it's actually the site of St. Simeon today. That was the, also the previous site of a pro and golf course and the Soundview stock farm, where champion thoroughbred horse named Raris. Uh, was was uh, raised and, and promoted. A local man, Edward H. King, a local farmer from Oregon, he purchased the land and leased it to the Eastern Suffolk Cooperative to run this labor camp. Um, it was all males who were housed at this camp. And one not notable uh, incident, 1947, a group of 200 workers from Mexico walked off the job protesting the wages at the time of day 66. They felt they should be paid more. There was a hearing at the local school in the county, and. The, they had no representation, the workers had no representation, the, farm, the farmers had their own, of course, the, the Farm Bureau was there, they heard the case, if you will, and uh, the Bureau ruled in favor of the farmers, and the workers went back to work seemingly the next day. It seems like a small incident, but it's a rare showing of unity uh, for workers from another country who had limited rights um, and, and just, you know, kind of uh, through solidarity wanted to, to protest the conditions and get better. This camp was in existence for almost 20 years as well. It was, uh, eventually it closed in 1966. It was their control fire that brought the structure down, and the land was later purchased, and today it's what San Simeon location is now, beautiful location with an important history there. These are photographs, very rare ones. I, I commend the uh, South Pole Library for these photographs. On the left, you can actually see the structure of the Compton Mansion. You see the pillars coming down. It's hard, kind of hard to see through the trees. On the right were the structures where the, the, the workers stayed in the, in the camp, which would have been to the side and the rear of the property. Um, you know, when I was doing my research, it was, you know, photographs, uh, aside from the South Pole Historical Society, were really hard to come by. So when I found these pictures, it, to, you know, it was very important to have, preserve, and promote and share. Here's a photograph of the Richard Conklin Mansion in the Tay Day when it was created. Um, again, the South Pole Library had these documents. Uh, very prominent land, very prominent area, and it was used for a lot of important reasons, or certainly a lot of reasons in the, in the location of the set. Uh, 1960, there's a lot more precise data I was able to uncover um, in terms of the number of camps. At this point, there were 120 camps in 1960, and you see the breakdown. And here in South Pole Town, there were 24 camps with the largest concentrated number of workers. And again, for good reasons, one of the largest areas with large lots of land, and a lot of the workers were centered here. 
people could get it. There's also potato farms in the South Fork as well. Uh, South Hampton had 13 camps and over 260 workers. Shelter Island, I'll get to shortly, but they only had a few camps, small island, kind of, uh, you wouldn't expect that there were some camps there. Riverhead was unique in that it had its own cluster of camps and had more camps total, 30 camps with 400 workers. And then going more west towards the county line, you see Brookhaven and Huntington had their own amount of camps. Here is a map, a migrant camp uh, locator map. Do you see each dot on this map denotes one labor camp. You see the clusters on the top left, obviously, the, where we are in South Fork in the North Fork area, going all the way out to the tip, like the way Orient, down below in, in South Fork. And you see the, the spread out of the clusters in Riverhead, and even more west by the county line. This was created by what was known as the Suffolk County Migrant Labor and Slum Housing Commission. Uh, again, an important resource for my research. This is the camp out in Riverhead, uh, approximately 1960. You'll notice the outhouse in the middle, which was later banned. Uh, but again, it, it, you can just see the, the ominous tone, the, the solitude, the, the rundown appearance that most of these camps really had. Next to it. Here's another one as well. Um, there was all these camps that had no, no trespassing signs, which were strictly enforced. Outsiders, reporters could not come, they would be arrested or attacked or worse. It was strictly enforced and it was kept private. Um, you know, they, they, a lot of the growers and camp operators didn't want what they call do-gooders coming to, to report, to look, to, to you know, you know they, in their eyes, they thought they were making trouble, but people were generally trying to help. And uh, that led to some confrontations as well. Now, Shelter Island had what was called the Beanery Plant. And this is a unique, uh, unique operation in the 1950s. The Beanery Plant, what they did here is they flesh flow, fresh flash froze lima beans and cauliflower in tremendous numbers, high output. And they sold them to companies like Libby's and Burza, which you see today, go and buy a bag of frozen peas and things. Shelter Island had a very large production going on at the time in the, in the 90s, um, I'm sorry, in the 1950s. Uh, they had these large equipment, these turbines, they had a large, uh, 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 big berth, it was called a large 24 inch diameter piston, a diesel engine, um, and they would probably uh, employ probably 15 to 20 workers from Alabama to Carolinas to work on these, on these camps. And it was such a big operation that even people on the island worked at the campus, at the, at the plant itself, but not doing the machinery work. That was up to the workers. Like a lot of women would work, they would be doing administrative duties. And it was a really large and burgeoning operation for its time. And just so you know, this, this, if, if you know where the Shelter Island Historical Society is, right next to the parking lot, this camp was right in that location. Right now it's paved you know, for people park. Um, that's where this went, next question. And it had a lot of really extent, extensive high equipment, and, and it probably ran for, if, if uh, local police were involved, if there was any fights between the workers or trouble, they would escort them off the island to, to the ferry and say, one way ticket, don't come back, and, which is problematic, because if you really don't have money and you're from Carolinas, how are you going to get home? So it really was a natural deterrent to try to keep order, and most of, for the most part it was. Um, but, you know, it, it was always that, that factor. Eventually, by the late 1950s, back-to-back uh, -back hurricanes struck this, the island, and also a pestilence, and that eventually led to the closing of the beanery. But it was really a, a fascinating um, uh, step. So, when I wrote the book, I didn't just want to <coughs> focus on the camps, the number of camps, the name of camps, and conditions. I wanted to really know more about the parties involved. And what, I, what I've identified is, yes, you have the migrant workers, you have the crew leaders, the growers, um, you also have the public, the government, the farm bureau, and it all had a part to play in this, whether small or large, uh, but it was all really intertwined. <clears throat> the best way to describe the economics of a labor camp is a cycle of perpetual debt. Right? Everything, housing, food, transportation, other fees, hidden or not, were, and usually paid by credit, um, with huge markups, uh, were deducted from the weekly earnings of the workers. Uh, and, and that was problematic, right? There was a woman in 1960 who went to Riverhead to complain to the, the local town that Social Security taxes were coming out of her check, but she didn't even have a Social Security number. So it was that kind of that kind of corruption, you know. And if you think about that, for one person, you know, maybe a few dollars here and a few dollars there, it adds up. You know, people are getting rich, and it wasn't the workers; they were struggling mightily with that. Payday was typically. Of the farm workers, so thank you for that. Um, we are going to open it up to questions and answers. So, if anyone has any questions, um, just raise your hand and I'll come to you with the microphone.
Apparently you interviewed at least one farmer, at least. So uh, my question is, did the farmers know about the, what happened at the labor camps? Well, I interviewed more than one farmer. I speak highly of Tom, Mr. Wicker, because I personally went on the farm with him. I also I believe I interviewed Marty Sido and some of the others. And, and, um, one of the things I'll point out before answering, it's a great question, thank you, is that there were two ways to look at this. There was, there was some of the generational farmers and growers, they operated differently from the labor camp era. They believed, and still believe, in quality over quantity. So, especially with the Wick, Mr. Wickham, the Wickham's farm, they would have their own, uh, construct their own living quarters on their own property. And the, the relationship there was great because it was direct between the grower and the workers. There was no middleman, if you will. And the middlemen were really led to much of the problems in this era. So, when I did speak to some farmers, they were aware. But as they would say, and perhaps rightfully so, is well, we contracted with the crew leaders and they got the workers and they were responsible, which is true. And there's no way to, to shirk the blame for the crew leaders. At the same time, I would point out, but you were fully aware of what was going on in your community, near your farms, um, and, and they acknowledged that, but, but again, diverted back to, well, that's the crew leader's responsibility. And I think that the farmers had enough worries, and, and in many ways they still do throughout the country, so, so, you know, from the market, the weather, and everything, the, all the economic factors that are against them. But at the same time, you know, could they have exerted more pressure on the crew leaders to be better? I believe so. Did they? I don't think they did. Um, uh, you know, so that's not necessarily an indictment, it's just a matter of fact. So, um, I believe that they were aware, and to the extent they could have done more, that's the main. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, who established uh, the, the hourly wage rate? Was it uh, negotiated or was it uh, decided on a Friday night over a couple of beers by a couple of farmers? Well, the, 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 it's a great question, thank you. The Farm Labor the, the, the farm labor Bureau typically would be involved in setting, and that wouldn't just be here, it would be regional. And it would also be coastwide, East Coast. Um, the workers were not, weren't paid minimum wage unless they worked in a potato shed, grading shed, and that was kind of rare. But on the farms, those rates were generally established to the Farm Bureau and adjusted by the market, which I think is still relevant and applicable today. Um, if the weather is bad, crops are bad, supply and demand will tell you that the market is going to go up and supply down, and, and then that can fluctuate. I do know that the big barn that was here in Cutshaw for almost 80 years and burnt down in 2006, a lot of the farmers would store their potatoes there for the season and then wait for, that, for the right time to sell. And that's I mean, this is capitalism. They, they earned it. They have these crops. And they want to drive up the market. The problem is that often affected the workers because their pay would be held up until those sales went through. So generally, the answer to your question is the market, and the market is kind of a big answer, but it's generally the Agricultural Bureau in connection with regional and perhaps the government levels. Um, certainly early on, the government levels, but later on, they would have some, I'm sure, input on that. Thank you. Yes? Men and women who were migrant workers generally represented the lowest level because in the South, uh, you had really, uh, I mean, uh, you were tenant farmers, okay, and you had the entire Jim Crow system. So these people, I guess, were driven by desperation in a, in a sense that they might be able to improve their existence doing migratory labor. How much, I, I mean, from the fires, the winter conditions, it seemed like these were year-round camps. Did you actually have people coming in the spring and then leaving in the fall and going back down south? They yeah. actually they found themselves here and then they didn't have the resources to return home. Uh, and or they would look for work in the area. You know, figuring Riverhead is a city, right? We, we don't, it's not Manhattan, but it's a city. It's the largest city this far east. Um, you know, to your, to your initial point, yes. And, and still today, you know, farm workers in this country are still at the bottom level of the strata of the labor um, system, right? It's, 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 strangely enough, it's among the hardest work. Um, physical labor to the land. It goes back to, you know, primal roots, right? Um, 
And, and the treatment is still lacking. The, the, the laws are still lacking. You know, when the New Deal came out and all these laws were promoted to, to get the country out of, into prosperity, out of the slum, slums, they were left off. And, and the workers, and they still are left off until barring any state laws. Uh, that set them back generations. And it was a real great tragedy. And of course, you're chasing, you know, the South was economically depressed. So they would, you know, when you hear a dollar minimum wage in Arkansas and a dollar 35 on Long Island, go to dollar 35. But, not, not knowing what you're really going to face, but that, that at least was a selling point to kind of move to chase the, the, the bigger market money, bigger money market. Here we go. Hi, listening to your story, I, I'm struck by the similarities that this is the third of the series of farm, right, the third? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, how the struggle for workers continues I, I, I certainly, I haven't heard anything like conditions that you've discussed, but the conditions are not good still. And they're still treated in a way that would not be acceptable. I think um, I heard repeated many times in these conversations, no American would do the work that they're doing. Um, but these, these guys, most of the guys, they come here because it's their only way to help their families back home. Again, the dollar thirty-five versus the dollar situation is still in existence, although now they're coming, as you know, from Central America primarily. Yes. And, and the, the irony is, this whole era, these workers are all U.S. citizens, uh, barring the Jamaica workers from Jamaica, um, Barbados, and Mexico, which were under U.S. government. And, you know, strangely, those were U.S. government programs; they were better. These are U.S. workers. Now, that's largely been replaced with workers from Central and South America. And there's a lot of factors that are different because people ask me. There are very few labor camps today, but certainly not like this era. And there's many factors why. There's affordable housing. There's different types of work. Um, you know, sadly, you see people even today. If you go to Home Depot, there's workers, day laborers looking for work. They got their own perils. Um, you know, it just comes down to to really you know people looking for work to feed their families and themselves and create a livelihood. And that's why I think Long Island volunteers had it right early on to look to try to train them to create other jobs, other tr other skilled trades to get out of this seemingly just dead end system. That's really what it was. Thank you for that. Okay. I think she had to be okay. I was just uh, curious about how the volunteers, the Long Island volunteers and the ministry and those who signed petitions got all the way in your book to Attorney General Robert Kennedy and nothing ever happened. Nothing. Yeah. So in your book, what happened to the government then? You know, the local politicians, um, they spoke out against the system, but it was all largely just talk. Mm -hmm. um, we have to remember this was farming communities and the constituents drove that and they would drive politically and economically and everything else. Um, if those changes that were necessary were going to be too costly for the farmers, then nobody would win. And it was easy to kind of push off, well, it's seasonal. You know, we start talking now in two, three months, it, it'll be different. You know, it, it's easy to look at that. But I think the county, and I, I mentioned that in the book that, it kind of took this ostracized approach. And that only drove up costs. It drove up uh, problems, first responders, uh, things affecting the community, people who, you know, who lived here. Um, and that, that approach really was, was foolhardy because should, more could have and should have been done. In fact, Arthur Bryan, who I mentioned, he testified before Congress in 1969, um, spoke you know, very very clearly and bluntly about the conditions here, and he showed a documentary they produced, and again, uh, even at that level, all talk, but little action. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Between Mill Lane and Kenny's Road on the south side of the street, kind of across from where the camp is. And I, I wanted to know if we could buy that book. Oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I, I can tell you, though, um, in the back of the book, there's a labor camp index, and it has named well over 100 camps, mo mostly just in name and local location alone. Um, trying to think of like for instance the short labor camp on old quad road in southampton you know you know if that was all that was that was to be had that that's what i would relay if there were more even through the research and documents or newspaper reportings i would add when i could when i could but really the pickings were slim on that that's why the cut camp is 
by far the largest one spoken of. Um, we but, knew about it as kids. Uh, exactly. We lived across, you know, down the road, uh, down like a road toward closer to the beach. So there were woods in between yes. our home and then Soundview Avenue. <clears throat> but of course, you know, my brothers were adventurous, shall we say. And even though they were forbidden to go back there, um, they did go back there. And uh, my, my mother said, don't go back there. There's a migrant camp back there. And she told us that they sent buses down to Georgia yeah. and picked these guys up in the middle of the night and put them on a bus and they were, you know, under the influence. Then yeah. they'd wake up and here they are. Yeah. And so we knew about it. So it's kind of interesting. That was, uh, there was a case of a farmer who lived on Oregon Road who was in the early, mid, the late 1950s. He, uh, no, no one knows who, but someone broke into his home, attacked him in his sleep, was slashing at him with a blade. You know, he didn't die, but he was really traumatized from it. Um, you know, the belief was they went to the camp and expected they could never find the, the person who did it, but, you know, it, it, it affected the whole community. It wasn't just, even if, you, if people wanted to ignore it, they couldn't, because things would happen and they often did. Saturday nights, I'm sure they talk about Saturday nights, the payday nights, it was always loud and raucous throughout the area, uh, for many reasons, frustration, um, partying, uh, you, you know, good and the bad, all these things tend to boil, t tend to boil over and lead to these problems, so. Thank you for your insight. Just an example of wages. 96 and 4, I was in high school, I was considered a farm worker. Minimum wage was a dollar and a quarter. Farm workers got 75 cents. Yeah. You know, it's, it's I, asked for, I asked for the minimum wage and they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have loved to have had a union there for sure. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was the travesty, you know, little, everything was stacked from the laws at the top to local treatment or improper treatment at lower levels. It, it just was a system that was totally, completely flawed. And, and you know, it's, it's the kind of history that keeps on expanding. I'm teaching a course down at Hofstra on this because when I wrote the book, I knew it was more than just the book. It was a teachable moment and it continues to be where we talk about the treatment of our fellow hum in humanity, but also economics farming, agriculture, the, a wide array of different interdisciplinary subjects in that. So it really is an important and complex system. I would not so good for the microphone, but I'd like to share an experience that I had that still haunts me. Um, I was I was young in the nineteen uh, fifties, and one of our neighbors uh, took me for a ride to a labor camp, um, and he had a whole bunch of very cheap watches, and he was selling them to the men there, and I I was very young maybe 10 or 12, and I, somehow I knew that wasn't right. Why was he doing that? He didn't need money. Um, and they had, there was a row of these buildings, and they were cooking outside, like at a, you know, a, a thing you barbecue thing. They were cooking meals. But I remember that and I, when I got home, I told my mother, and she was very upset about it, very upset. I think she went to the, this guy's family and told him he was doing this. And that, that has haunted me over the years. So people, why would he sell them these horrible, cheap, like toy watches when they had no money? It, it, it just, it's haunted me, you know, like for 75 years. Thank you for sharing that, and, and, and yes, there were many of these haunting experiences, and that's why it was important. When I, when I learned of this, I knew there was more to tell, and when I researched it, the, that obligation grew to tell it, because like yourself, you know, I've never met you, and hearing that story is, is touching, because these things did happen, and, and you know, it's important to look at and study and understand and, and, and talk about how it affected all, all of us, the community, both then and now. Uh, a lot of the camps, they... They, you know, a lot of the camp operators would let these illicit drug dealers and, and 
selling alcohol to the camp, and they would let them sell it. And at the local, they would drink this bottle, it was called Twister. It was this cheap California grape wine, very addictive. And at the local store, it would sell for 61 cents. Right? So if you're gonna walk three miles from Cox Lane to the local store, and three miles back, all right. At the camp, they sold it for $1.20. Hmm. You know, 10 hour days, you're tired, you're exhausted, just put it on my bill. Let me get in, maybe two, whatever. It was that kind of, and hence that a lot of times, the cool thing is that they found out you walked to the store, they would retaliate. And you know how they would retaliate? They would not let you work for two, or three, four days. So now you're not getting an income, but you're still having the debt mount up. So, you know, it was a lot of that going on, and, and that kind of the, the, the illicit behavior was, it was pretty bad. But thank you for sharing that. Thank you. As a result of the um, laborers' act, um, in the present conditions in the in the farms, we have Latino workers from Mexico, Santo Domingo, Nicaragua. Uh, do they have camps that exist still existing on both forks now for them? There are probably a handful of camps, much different than what it was. You'll see a lot of them at the large uh, uh, nursery places, um, but they're much different than they were. And you're right, these workers now come internationally, Central America, South America. Um, but one thing I would have thought, and I still do some respect, right? There's one thing when you're picking potatoes, and, and it's hard work, people. If you don't know, but trust me, learn it. It's hard work. I'm just by being it, I'm, I'm it, it, it's tiring. But when you're curing grapes for multi-million dollar vineyards, and let's face it, the North Fork wine industry is a multi-million dollar industry, right? Yeah, it's a little more artistical than that. You have to know how to cure those vines, how to work with that, that product. So you would think that that could drive up the value or pay for a worker. They trust you, you come back year after year, you know how to work, you're trusted, you're, you're delicate, you, you, you have the knowledge, not by training, training on site. It's not that they went to school for this, they learned it through experience. But I'm not so sure, and, and, and we see, sadly, with Pindar, and I'm in touch with those, that union who's organized those workers, they're still fighting, they're still resisting, there's, there's allegations of bad, of, um, bad labor dealings, um, but there are others who are trying to organize and join the union, and, and the union gives you that ability to at least negotiate for more money, to fight against bad or worsening conditions. It gives you that authority, but without a state law, it didn't happen until 2020, that was 80 plus years where many people worked lived and died under real bad conditions. And that's kind of sad. So um, it, it's, a, it's a little, it's certainly very different now than what it was. No, not only in number, but in, in, in status and conditions, it's a lot better now. And there's also um, uh, places where people can live nearby, low income housing and other opportunities, where back then that wasn't really existent. So it was either labor camp or nothing. So here there's a little more opportunities and slightly would lead to better options. If there weren't any other questions, um, I guess just a little housekeeping. Mark did bring his um, book, Dust for Blood, with him today. And if you'd like to purchase it, you're welcome to. He actually did the talk for us, you know, without any expectation of, of compensation. So I really appreciate that. And, and while we also do sell this in the museum gift shop, I encourage you to purchase it directly from him. Um, we had initially intended for this to be our third and final lecture of the series, and I have been in conversation, we've had some dialogue with the Eastern Farm Workers Association, and um, we're tentatively, we scheduled a date of March 23rd. It's not firm, I will definitely ask, um, we'll publicize it, but for them to come. They were founded in 1972, so just towards the end, end of the labor camp era? Uh, yes, yeah, towards the end. They were involved, and I do mention them in the book, and I met with them. They actually put me in touch with some of the migrant workers. Uh, at least one of them sadly mm -hmm. passed away recently. They were a great group. They, 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 they would do small things that you seem small, but are very big. For instance, they would collect monies, and they would give insect repellent to the workers out in the field. Right? We all know what the insects are. That's a big, that's a nice perk to have, something to have to help the workers. They would try to organize things for food and all this stuff. So. It's more like a fraternal organization, which the work is